Hello to the Blackbird PIMCO video blog. In our third tutorial, we show you how to create and edit objects from one raw data item, like a CSV file for example. We continue with automatic translation and changing a PIMCO data object field type without losing data. Next, we will look at how automatic data generation from other fields works, e.g. to generate URLs like based on product names. Today's tutorial will close with a look at imports assets from file system folders. So let's go! Check it out and have fun! Welcome to the third workshop about the Data Director plugin for PIMCore. Today I'd like to speak about some advanced imports um, which are based on the knowledge which you have received from the previous workshops. So the first workshop was about how to set up imports in general. And the second one was about how to start, or about the different ways how to start those imports. Today I'd like to explain you some advanced import features, and namely these are those five points here. At first I'd like to explain how we can create or edit multiple objects from one, one raw data item. What this means uh, I'll explain in some minutes. The second topic will be automatic translation via the DeepL API. With that we can translate nearly everything, so data object input fields, text area, Visivic fields, and also documents and assets if you want to, all such things. Um, at, as third topic today, we'll cover how we can change the field type of an uh, of, a, of a data object field without losing data. Um, this is especially important because when you're un an unexperienced PIMCore user, then it might uh, it may happen that you do not choose the optimal data type for your use case. And perhaps you will recognize this later on, but when you then would change the data type of the field in your in your class, for example, or in your object brick, or in your field collection, then with most data types, this means that the previously entered data gets lost. And that's a real problem, and with the data director, we can solve this challenge without losing any data. As a fourth topic, I'd like to say something about how we can automatically create or generate data from other fields contents. For example, how we can create a URL slug based on a product's name or category name, something like that. And as the fifth topic, I'd like to show you how we can import or synchronize assets from a file system folder. For example, when you have a media server and want to import all the images and assets from that server to your PIM core, then you can use the Data Director plugin to solve this task. But at first, I'd like to show you how we can import multiple objects from one raw data set in a CSV file. Uh, for that, I've prepared a little PIM core again with our Docker demo. You also can use this Docker demo when, you, uh, when you've bought the plugin. There is a, an examples folder in the, in the plugin folder and all the workshop tasks and examples are in there in the examples folder. But, but for this workshop, I'd, I will show you how to manually, manually create those data ports um, to, uh, so I can explain each step. Um, I have set up a little PIM core um, that's quite empty. Again, we will using the core shop data model, so we do not have to create the classes ourselves, but we will use those which get installed by core shop. And as our CSV file, which we will import, for simplicity, I imported it to the PIMCore assets. Of course, we could also use um, the file system file as the import so resource, but for simplicity, I, I uploaded it to the PIMCore assets. Um, to better read it, I opened that file in the table calculation. Um, we have some the following columns in our CSV file. The first column is the SKU, so that's the product number, 
Then we have the product name, we have the description of the product, we have the product's categories and the weight of the product. Again, we are using uh, some bikes as products and this is our data which we want to import. So the first thing we want to achieve is how we can create multiple objects from one raw data item. And this especially is important for the categories in this case. We see that in the categories column, there is a comma separated list of categories which shall be assigned to the product. But before being able to assign those, we have to create the category objects uh, from this file. Um, so for the first product, we want to achieve that three category objects are being created, trekking bikes, mountain bikes and e-bikes. And for that we have to split up the content of the field and handle those separately. And I'd like to show you how we can do that with the data director. So at first I'd like to create the categories import. For that I go to the data director panel and there create a new data port for the categories. As the source data type, I will choose CSV, as I've shown you the CSV file. We want to create a core shop category objects, so I choose that as import class. As the CSV resource, I assign our CSV file. I'd like to create the category objects in the folder categories. Assets are not being involved, so we keep those fields as they are. In the first row, of the CSV file we have the field names, so these are those, and that's it. Just create the fields automatically, and there they are. Uh, for the categories import we only need the categories column, so I'll just delete the other ones and press the save button. In the example data we already see that it should work and to import the complete raw data I start the raw data import. This step extracts the, the, the set raw data fields from the import resource or so from our CSV file and when this is done we should have those two, uh, those two items from our CSV file and when we look at the preview there they are. But now we see here that still they are comma separated strings. So now comes the, po uh, the critical point where we split those uh, comma separated strings up into separate category names. And this gets done in the attribute mapping. Um, for our example, I will use the category name also as the key. And so I, I select the raw data field categories, but still the example result, you see this is the comma separated string. So that would only create one object with this, uh, with this whole name, but it's not what we want. So we want actually two categories, dirt bikes and cross bikes for this example. So we go to the settings for this field mapping and here we see uh, or for, for now it's the first time where we actually have to use the callback function which we have to implement here. Um, at first in the previous workshops we always had a template we just could use and did not have to create the callback function ourselves. But in this advanced case we have to because we cannot uh, we cannot cover all different use cases uh, in, with the templates. Um, but there's a little help. On the right side we see the available variables which are given to our callback function. And when we when I move the mouse over this um, over this variable then we see what the value of this variable will be in our callback function. So params value for example always contains the content of the mapped raw data field. So this is the content, how it is in the CSV file 
and we see at the bottom there is this, uh, this comma separated string. The next variable is the raw item data. This is the uh, raw item data of all this, the CS, uh, of all the CSV files. In this case, it's of course only the categories because we have only uh, as raw data fields only the categories. Um, but later on, when we import the products, then I'll, I'll show you that there are also some more fields. Uh, current value is what is the current value of the found object in uh, in the field we are currently which we are currently mapping. So in the key field. This is currently null uh, or false because we do not have any object, any category object in our PIM core. For this reason, this is uh, this is not set. Same goes for current object data, which contains all fields of the uh, of the currently found uh, data object, or namely PIM core element, because you can also import other things than data objects. Uh, all those. Lot three are empty for now. But as we already saw in the first uh, variable in the parents value, there is the string we'll, which we want to ex ex um, which we want to uh, extract our information from. Um, to get the single categories, we just have to split this string into separate values and return the the array which which then um, gets created. And from that, we can use the explode PHP function. When we do that, and press the save button, then we see that we now return an array, third bikes and cross bikes, and we also see that in the parsed area. The problem now is when we would start the import, then, uh, forgot the key attribute, uh, when we start the import, then the key attribute returns two items, dirt bikes and cross bikes. And the import, uh, the, the data object import, happens as follows. At first, we create all combinations from all key fields. So, in this case, we have only one key field, so we have only two combina uh, or two combinations of key fields, but when you imagine importing uh, product attributes, for example, and when you have T-shirts with colors and and uh, sizes, for example, those T-shirts can have color red and blue and sizes M and L, uh, medium and large, then the data and both will be used as key fields. Then the data director generates four combinations, namely blue and medium, blue and large, red and medium, and red and large. So all combinations of all key fields are getting created, and for all those, the import gets executed. But there is a little problem here. When we return an array, the same data currently gets used for the object querying phase and for the data setting phase. Uh, so when you imagine the import is separated into two phases and the first step we use the key fields to find already existing objects with, uh, which have our key fields. In the second phase we assign the values to those found objects. But when we return in the callback function an array, then we cannot assign this array uh, to the field, uh, to the key, to the object key, because this has to be a string, of course. And for this reason, we have to again, or we have to add something to our callback function. When I hovered this, um, or now you see that in the parents key values, there is a value, and we see there that in iteration one, the key will be dirt bikes, and in iteration two, the key will be cross bikes. And we can use that to, to, to return only the string which is currently used as the key in, for, the, uh, for the object querying phase, and we use that key 
and return it for the data setting phase. And for that, I added the callback function. and return the key which is currently handled. So now what happens here? We check if the params key values is set. And when I hover that again, we see it in the, on the top in the description, in the tooltip uh, the tool description at the end. Uh, this, param, uh, this variable is not available in object querying phase. You see it? This means when we execute the callback function in the object querying phase, then this, one, this if is not true. And for this reason, we just return the array of the single category names. This gets used to create the combinations for our data object import. And in the first iteration, as, it's, as you can see here, in the first iteration, the first array item which we return here gets used, for example, in this case, dirt bikes. And with that value, we'll, we try to find an object which has the key dirt bikes, a data object which has the key dirt bikes. Uh, when we find one, uh, that's OK. When we do not find one, then we'll create a, a new category object. And then it comes to the second phase of the data object import. Then we want to set the values to the newly created objects or to the, to the found object. And in this phase, now the parent's key values is set. Uh, and when we call the callback function again. And in this case, we just return what is inside key values key. And you see it here. Key values is an array which contains all Key, key fields and uh, you see that I just ex ex uh, access the key here but when you have multiple key fields um, there would be also multiple elements in each uh, in each area item here so when we save that you see that the the example result will change to only dirt bikes now, that's due to the limitation of this preview, but in reality, uh, you'll see that in the background, there is more uh, that the whole error creation is working. Uh, to show you this, I go to the preview panel and import this first item. There you see that we import raw item, fear, uh, raw item 4. Uh, as the key column callback return, we see that an array gets returned with the single category names. And then for, for each combination of the key fields, we now execute the import. At first, we'll, uh, the dirt box gets handled. It's get, uh, just tried to find a category object with the key dirt box, but currently, obvious, of course, not, no, nothing, uh, no object exists with this key. And for this reason, it creates a new object. And then it gets interesting. The callback return for the field key is now only dirt bikes. So that's the different phases. And the first phase, that's the object querying phase. We return the array, which gets used for generating the combinations of the key fields. And in the second phase, where we set the, da the data to the found objects or to the newly created objects, there we return a string. Uh, same goes for the cross bikes, and at the end, both categories get saved. And when we look at the data objects tree, there we see our two categories have been created. Yes, so that's for the categories, and now we want to. Oh no, I have to. I forgot to, to start the full import because. At the end, there were some more categories. You see here, we, we imported this dirt bikes and cross bikes. 
and those three got, uh, were missing. If you wonder why the dirt bikes and cross bikes got imported first, this is because the raw data fields get ordered by the by, uh, ordered alphabetically, and as we only have one raw data field categories, those values get get sorted num uh, alphabetically, and the D comes before the T, and for this reason, the T, the, the the dirt bikes and cross bikes got imported first. Now let's look here. The import is is done. And when we refresh the categories in the data objects tree, then we see all five categories have been created. Now, of course, we do not only want to set the object key for our categories, but also the, the name. And we could do that the same way as we did with the key fields above here, but there is a simpler way. Uh, with the name, we just go to the settings, and here we see that beside the generic variables, we also have the mapped fields. And here is the parsed value of all the mapped fields uh, of our attribute mapping of, the data, of this data port. In this case, we only have one map field, which is the key, and we can just use that and return it, and we'll see that this is now dirt bikes. So this now gets the value from the parsed uh, value of this key field and it just now work, uh, just works. Um, this is especially useful when you later on change the logic in the callback function for the key field, for example, then automatically also the, the logic for the English name would change. This is not always wanted, but sometimes it is. Um, so we have seen this syntax before for virtual fields in other workshops, but you can also use this syntax to ex access the parsed values of other mapped fields. Right. So when we import this raw, raw item again, then we'll see that this gets imported and callback return for field key is dirt bikes and callback return for field name en, so that's the English name, is also dirt bikes. So that works. We start to complete import. And in the meantime, um, go to the dirt bikes object. And we see that the English name got filled with dirt bikes. So this way you can access the parsed values of other mapped fields. Now we come to the next point. We want to assign those categories to products. And for this I create another data port named products. Again, that's pretty much the same. The source data type is CSV. Now our import class is core shop product. As the import resource, we use the CSV file. First name contains our uh, contains the field names. Now we want to create those uh, those objects in a folder named products. And again, we press press the auto create button, which extracts the fields from our CSV file. Uh, for now, we have to use all of these columns, so I just press save. And when we look at the example data, we see that this is our data from the CSV file. Now I start the raw data import so that we have the complete data extracted from our CSV file. And when we look here, there we have the data. That's everything which we already saw in our table calculation. Okay, now 
again, we, we will have to look for the categories column, but of course all those other fields, uh, we will import all those other fields too. Um, for this import, we'll use the SKU as the key field. So that's the product number. I just assign this with the Dropbox and set it to be the key attribute. Other fields we want to assign are the product name, um, product description is here, description, categories, I'll come to that in a minute, and also the weight of our bike. Okay, again, most important thing here is the tracking uh, is the categories field. We see here that is on, again only the comma separated string. So we have to implement a callback function which which splits up this string. Again, we can use this params value, but as you have learned in the other workshop, for relational fields, we have to to say PIMCore how it can find the the objects with the with the set values. It's not enough to just return a string. Uh, PIMCore do, does not know how to how, how to find the objects with a string. And for this reason, we pre uh, the data director plugin provides an, a template which we can use and edit that and yes, to solve this task. Again, in params values, we see that there is this comma separated string and we will use that and edit our callback function. I put our explode expression, which we already used for the categories import, just here in this for each loop, so the string gets split up into an array and every array or every category name now is in variable item. And to say PIMCore how it can find uh, the those category objects based on the category name, we have to return the data query selector. Again, I, I'll tell you how this is built up. Uh, it's based on two parts. It consists of two part, uh, of three three parts. The first part, uh, so the, those three parts are separated by colons. The first part is the class which we want to find an object of. The second part is the field which we want to use for filtering. And the third part is the value which we will use to filtering. So what this does is we want to look for a core shop category object object whose path is the given item. And as we have um, put our category objects to the folder categories, we have to uh, set it up here and pr press the save button. Here we see that those, um, an array of those data query selectors gets returned and when we scroll a bit further, then we see in the past column that those objects get found. So it finds an object with the full path categories tracking bikes, and another object with categories mountain bikes, and another object categories e bikes. So this seems to work, and now we are ready to import this. Again, at first I always start. A, raw, uh, a PIM import with only one, one raw data item just to not or just to be sure just to ensure that everything works fine without creating thousands of objects. When we do that again it, I explain it um, it we just import raw item 5 no item got found with the SKU1234, so it creates a new one. And for the field categories, the callback return, the callback function returns an array with our data query selectors. 
For all those other mapped fields, we do not see, see anything in the log um, because this just maps the, the fields from the intermediate table to the data objects. We, we do not log that just to save some space. And at the end, uh, we see that the product gets, product gets saved to this path. When we look into the product folder, then we see 1234 got created. And when we look at it, then all the categories should have been assigned. There they are. Now, as we are sure that our import works, we can use the PIM import or start the PIM import again to import all data. And when this is done, also the data from this other product, product 1235, should also be in our data objects tree. 1235. Categories, there they are. So that's how we can split up um, values which are concatenated in our import resource and split those up when importing. Now, if you wonder why this, those products got the object key 1234 and 1235, although we haven't set explicitly an object key, uh, this is because when there isn't any key explicitly being said, then the and then the all all key fields are getting used as or to generate the object key. So they are um, concatenated with underscore, and but of course in this case we only have one key field, which is the SKU, and for this reason the objects which got created get the get the object key based on their SKU. Okay, now when we look at those objects, we also see that there is the description. Currently, there is only the English description, but as we come to our second topic, I'd like to tell you something about how we can translate this English description. Of course, first we have to add another language to our PIM core. Do that in the system settings and for example add German. Press save and reload our PIMCO backend. And when we now go to the data director, um, or let's just Look at the product again. When we look at the details tab, there is now an additional tab for the German description. And we want to generate this German description automatically from the English description. For doing that, I create a separate data port. We could uh, include that into the products import but then we could only translate the values which come from our CSV file, for example. But I'd like to show you a way how we can set up a data port which automatically creates the translations no matter how the product objects get saved. So, for example, they could be manually saved or they could be saved by another data port or they could be saved by your application. And for that, I create a new data port translation. This time we will use the source data type PIMCore. Um, this means we import data from our PIMCore op data objects. The import class will be CoreShop uh, product. This is the target class, but for this case we, we, we want to use the same class as a source data class and from this class we want to 
get following fields. First we will use the ID. We'll use that to identify the object which have, has been edited. And as a second field we will use the English name uh, description. Description EN. Description English. Now if you wonder how this works, that's pretty much the same as we had used before, that's a data query selector and we access the, from the found objects, we now access the description in the English language. You also can change those data query selectors, but we'll come to that in the next workshop where we'll handle export. For now it's enough to just import the, the English description and this will be this will get used for translation. For the translation we go to the attribute mapping and there we'll have to set up that we want to translate those. At first the fields which are pretty basic we want to use the ID and use that as a key attribute. Now we come to the translation. Let me look for the description field. There it is. For the German description, we want to use the English description as a base and translate this English, trans uh, English description automatically to German. As you can see for localized fields, every field is available uh, has a separate mapping or can be mapped separately in the attribute mapping. So when you see here the description EN and description DE, but of course it's one, only one uh, localized field but with two descriptions. For our German description we can just assign the raw data field description EN which contains the English description and then in the settings we just have to uh, say to the data director in which language is the the source data and in this case we just select English and then we are done. Uh, we see it here the example result returns the content from the English description which we extracted from our data objects and in the parsed column we see that there already is the translated value. Now when we execute, uh, well, let, me, let, let me start a raw data import first that we can, uh, that I can show you the logs of, of a translation. We see here our intermediate table after extracting the data from our PIMCore data objects. Um, so this is the English description which is in our products. This tracking bike. Oh, there's a mistake. Uh, this tracking bike comes with all the necessary accessories for bicycle touring, and this is also the string here. Now, when we import one raw data item, then we can see the output for a translation. Uh, we see here that it imports products 1, 2, 3, 5 and the translation result for description DE is this value. Now to save you or as the or for, for, for using this you cur currently have to um, to buy a DeepL API account. You can just do that and it's just costs about five euro per. Uh, let me go here. To do translation, you have to um, buy this little DeepL API account. It costs five euro per month, and additionally twenty euro per one million translated characters. So that's the cost for that, and. Then, then you get an API key and put that into your PIMCore configuration YAML file and that's everything you have to do. 
Um, yes. To save you some money, we have implemented some features so that not in every case the translation will be done again and again. Because as you saw in our attribute preview, there was already the translation done, so that was the first time. Then we executed it again when we started the, the single raw item import. And later on it could happen again and again when we re-import this, um, uh, or uh, retranslate this product. But to say, but th as this would waste money because we already have this translation, um, for this reason we, we cache the translations and also do not translate if the source value, so the English description, when this hasn't changed, then we also do not uh, trigger a translation, as it would waste your money. When we now look at, or let me just start the complete import, when we now look at the objects and refresh that, then we see the English description and also the German one. So when you compare those descriptions and are able to understand those two languages, then you can see that even, um, even if there's an error in the English one, uh, the German is rather clean, the German translation is rather clean. So it uh, is really a clever translation. And in our experience, the DeepL, DeepL translations are really good, especially for product uh, or the e-commerce area. Um, for product descriptions, product names, and such things. Um, it isn't only possible to translate uh, simple text fields and text area fields, but also te uh, WYSIWYG fields. So when you have images and HTML formatting in your WYSIWYG fields, uh, we tell DeepL to, uh, to, to recognize those and the the resulting HTML, which then gets input, which can, then gets written to the WYSIWYG field again, um, is stays the same. The, the HTML structure stays the same, and only the text information gets translated. This is so clever that it also translates. For example, when you have embedded an image in your WYSIWYG field, that it translates the alt attribute or title attributes. So the DeepL API is, is really clever about uh, how, uh, how to handle HTML in, for, in this case. Now I described her to, to show you that for, for this case, we, we triggered the import manually. But when, when your content editors added the field, then we could also try, want to try to automatically create those values. And for this reason, we can check this little checkbox run automatically on new data. When we do so, as soon as the product object gets saved, be it manually or through your application, or for example through, a, through another import, then the, uh, the, the translation data port gets automatically triggered for that single object. Um, to show you this, I'd like to Add another sentence and press the save button. Then now in the background the data port, um, the import gets started. You see that here in the history and manual panel we see in the source definition this is our object with the ID uh, 23. Um, so the, the translation process got started. It gets started twice because uh, the data director doesn't know which fields um, got changed. So when we first press the save button, then it triggered this data port. This translated the, the description and afterwards, because the save got called again uh, for saving the description, um, the, the import gets started again. But in this, um, in this uh, second import, the data director is clever enough to recognize that there hasn't been any change 
to the raw data fields and for this reason uh, it doesn't import anything in the second run. So there isn't any endless loop or something if you're afraid of that. Now when we refresh that object and go to the German translation then we see that our new sentence also got translated. Now there are some cases where this isn't the wanted behavior that for example most often perhaps you want to translate all your, your product descriptions first and then later on some a real translator, a real person should care for the German translations. But to help him initially you do automatic translation. When we would set it up the way we did now, um, manually edit to the German translations would get overwritten. For example, if the translator added, added a, sen a sentence, and this wouldn't be a problem as, uh, as long as the English uh, description isn't touched, then, then there wouldn't be any new translation being triggered. But as soon as we touch the English description also, um, when we do it now and refresh the object, let's see if this has already been done. Then we see in the English description is this one. Ah, no, haven't been done. Then we see the English description how we edited it, but the German uh, German description got overwritten, and this is not wanted behavior in some cases. Per, certainly, when you have um, done manually changes to any of the translations. For this case, there is a little checkbox which is available for all fields, but for this use case it's especially useful and that's in the mapping options that's a do not override if already filled checkbox. You can use that and this now when the import gets started the data director checks is the is the target field so the german description already filled if it is then the translation uh, wouldn't been done so when we reset the description to what we had before and now use the and now also change the english description this way then we'll see that the German description isn't been touched you see it here this, this is a German tr translation which we edited manually and this is not the same as there is in English now, when you then certainly want to trigger um, the translation again, the automatic translation again, perhaps someone uh, got a mistake there or did some, something wrong, then you can just delete uh, delete all, this, all the description and then uh, translate it, uh, start the translation again. And when we refresh the object, Then we'll see that German translation is now again based on the English translation. Yes. So there are some other bundles which allow translating PIMCore data to other languages. When you look at the PIMCore marketplace, there are several bundles which do that. Um, but I haven't seen so far a solution which allows to 
execute translations automatically. So as we did when we press the save button, um, or of course it would also work when your application saves an object that would also trigger the translation uh, import. Um, and on the other hand, the an advantage of this translation, translation solution is that we can start it for as much products as we want. So as before, it uses the same mechanisms which would get applied for other imports. Um, we select the data from our import resource, then translate the data and set it to our PIMCO objects. So we aren't limited to the number of translations which we want to do. And for this reason, I'd say, of course, this is a subjective view, uh, this is the most advanced solution for translating text data for PIMCore. And also um, an advantage in comparison to other solutions is the cost savings, as I explained, that the translations are cached. For example, that's ex important when you have a master-slave hierarchy and only want to or have the same text in multiple objects, then you do not have to pay for translating every object, but only once the text gets translated and cached. And when a, a text already got translated previously, then it can be reused just from the cache without triggering the DeepL API. As a next topic, I'd like to show you how we can change the, ob the field types of PIM core data object fields without losing data. I will show you that in the example of the products. In our CSV file, we had the weight of the products as a column and imported that to the weight field in the product objects. So when we go to the shipping tab, there we see that we have the weight here. Now, for historical reasons, the field type of this weight field for the Koshap, uh, Koshap product class is a numerical field. And we, you can see that when we open this, then we see type number. But in the meantime, a more appropriate field has been introduced, which is a quantity value field, which consists of a value and a unit, because weight 11 doesn't really say, a th say anything except when you define that all weights given here or entered here have to be set in kilograms. But it's better to be explicit because of that I want to change the data type to a quantity value field with the unit kilogram. To do that, I'll create first a new data port called change data type. The source data type again is PIMCore, and we want to get uh, create um, create product objects. So source data class and import class of course of product, and everything else can stay the same. We'll need the, the ID again to identify the objects, and we need the weight. Now I start the raw data import and then we'll change the actual data type. The process is to first import the data from the existing objects, then change the data type and afterwards reset it to the new data type. Let me just look at it. This is our data which we got from all our product objects. When we now change the data type of the weight field to, oh no, first we have to add the quantity value unit. So we add kilogram, kilogram. When we now change the field to a quantity value field with the valid unit kilogram, 
and refresh the object, then we will see what the actual problem is. We see that the weight is now empty, so the 11 is gone. Before it was 11, but now it's gone. And that happens for a lot of data types. When you, for example, previously had a select field and later on um, recognized that this wasn't optimal, now you want to change it to, to a relation, for example, to a many-to-many -many object relation, then it's the same. You cannot just change the data type and the, um, the data will, will get lost. So for this reason, we first imported the data from our product objects to this intermediate table with the data director and now are able to set up um, a data port which or, or to set the mapping in our data port which can reset the values to the new field type. To do so, let me just again set the key field and then we set the weight. But as weight is a quantity value field now, we have to provide or we have to tell Pimcore what unit is this value which is in the in the weight raw data, what unit is it in. And for this we have an, a template here which comes with the data director for all allowed units for this quantity value field. We can just select input kilogram and so we are done. Now we see that 9 kilogram gets returned and when we start, let me start, again start a single raw item import first, that we see what happens. We see that the callback return for field weight is now this array and the data director interprets that or, or converts that to a quantity value object and assigns that to products 1, 2, 3, 5. So let's just open that. And when we look at the shipping panel, then we see that the weight is 9 kilogram and everything is fine. Now let's do the same for the 1, 2, 3, 4. This one. And when we refresh that object, we now again have those 11 kilogram. So without the data director, it's really critical to, from the beginning, the initial phase of your PIMCO project, to set up the data model for all time. Because when you want to change the data model, it's really complicated to change the field types without losing data. But with the data director, it isn't as critical um, when you make uh, mistakes in the data modeling phase uh, with the data director you can change the field types afterwards. Same does, uh, same, um, same goes for data, data classes, object bricks, field collections, everything like that and also for all field types. Uh, some are compatible, for example when you change um, a numerical field to, um, to an input field for that change you wouldn't need the data director, but for all complex data types, relations, quantity values for example, and all such things, uh, when you change those, uh, you will lose the data uh, with a native PIMCore system. But the data director can support you uh, uh, for changing the field types without losing any data. Okay, and then as a fourth topic today, I'd like to show you how you can automatically generate data from other fields, for example, to generate a URL slug. For that, the Core Shop product class doesn't, uh, doesn't ship with a URL slug field itself. Um, we just add a new field, the input field, which we'll call URL slug. And we set up a new data port for that. And again, it's pretty much the same as a translation. 
we'll reset the source data type to PIM core, import class to the product, source class also product, and we run it automatically. So as soon as we change, for example, the product name, then also the URL slug should be generated again. Again, we add the fields which we want to base our slug on. Um, it's the, for example, the English name, or let's do that for both English and German. Okay, uh, German name hasn't been set because we have previously only imported the English name. But we will, uh, in a minute, we will do that. Uh, we will edit the name manually. And the attribute mapping, also pretty much the same as, as in previous import. The ID is the key attribute. And for the, um, for the URL slug, no. We haven't set that as a localized field. We should put it in here. When we now refresh the attribute mapping. Then we see URLs like EN and URLs like DE. Uh, we will base our URLs like on the names, of course, in the corresponding language. And in the callback function, there we can uh, do something like um, return, uh, re re replace the, the white spaces by dashes, and also lowercase the, the URL slug. So when we do that, then the, the result will be this way, and we'll use the same result function for German, URL slug, and that's it. Uh, of course, we, <laughs> we have no data in it, so the preview also is empty. Now, as we have set the import to be run automatically, we can just go here and enter or change the product name. When we are here and enter a new German name, um, and press the save button, then in the background, the import gets started and our field, field, our field to be filled is this one at the bottom here. And now when we refresh the object, then we will see that the, the URL slug got automatically created from our product name. The same as for this rental bike. Here we see that the dash <coughs> or the white space got replaced by the dash and the lower case. And again, as before for translations, when you want to have consistent URLs, then you would enable the this do not overwrite if already filled uh, checkbox. This means if there has been, um, if, the, if a URL like has been generated before, then it won't be generated again. Even if you change the name of the product, then it won't be generated. The URL like won't be generated again. Let me show this. And when we Change the English name, or have I? I've of course, set it to both fields. When we change the English name to Rental Bike 2000, and we have the URLs like Rental Bike, and save it, and then wait some seconds for the import to be executed, and then refresh the object. Then we'll see that the URLs like stay the same but the name got changed. And this way you can generate, for example, URL slugs, but also 
For example, when you have the description, you can generate the short description from the long description. You can create a meta description, for example, or you can fetch or you can, for example, generate the description out of some technical attributes. For example, when your bike has a wheel size, uh, the number of gears and all such things, you can automatically generate the description um, this way. So that's a, a possibility. Um, when you want to base your generation on multiple fields, then you couldn't, uh, you wouldn't only use params value, but also this params raw item data. And there you see you can access all other raw data fields. Uh, you see it here, name en, name de, and for example, when you would also um, fetch the categories names. Let me show you how this can be achieved. Uh, main category, for example. We use the categories relation. Categories relation. There it is. And we fetch the first item from this relation. And from this first item, we use the name. So we just define that the first item in the categories relation is the main category and fetch the English name of that and we save that then we see that this is dirt bikes and when we look at object 22 which is this one and then we see dirt bikes is the first category of this object and here in this example you already see how data query selectors uh, data query selector chaining works um, we fetch the categories uh, we call the get categories method of the of the object. From this returned array, we we take the first item from that then is a category object, and from that category object we use the get name uh, function and provide en as a parameter. That's how those data query selectors works and those data query selector chaining. This comes especially important when doing exports, but in this case also for imports, for example, when you want to use that for your URL slug. Now when you go to the attribute mapping and to the English URL slug, then we'll see that in the raw item data there is the main category available. And when we want to use that, for example, here, uh, let me just copy that. In category value. Press save. Perhaps we should add a little slash. then our URL slug would look like that. And so that's the main category and after that the product name. So that would also be possible. One advantage of this uh, generation is that you can, when you want, you can manually edit, it, edit this generated value. Um, in contrast, when you would use a calculated field, then you of course could also do the same calculation or same logic to generate this value, but a calculated field is always read only, so an, a content editor would not be able to edit the generated values. So for this reason, generating values with the data director is also a good way uh, yes, to do that, especially with the checkbox that you do not want to override the contents if this, this is already filled. As last topic for today, I'd like to show you how you can import assets from a file system folder. This seems a pretty easy task, but in fact it isn't uh, with the default PIM core system. I'd like to show you what I mean. In the assets area, I want to import some assets from a folder on my server. Um, in, our, in our case, this is a normal um, local folder, but you could imagine when you have a media server and you want to um, synchronize that with your PIM core assets, then you could 
mount the media server um, as, um, as a, in a directory on your PIMCore server and then access those images from there. But I'll, I'll show you what the problem with that is. Uh, I've, uh, I've prepared those this images directory and when we import that, then we see that it initially works, the images are there. But then when you want to re-import those assets, then comes the problem. Uh, let me introduce, uh, let me start it, this, let me start this import again. Then you see that the already existing images have not been overwritten, but a duplicate has been created with underscore one. <clears throat> and this does make it impossible to synchronize a file system folder with the PIMCore assets uh, via import from server feature. Now, when you want to do that, <clears throat> you could use the WebDAV interface which PIMCore provides this would allow overriding existing images, um, but the problem with that is that then PIMCore becomes the master system for your media, for your assets. This is not always wanted uh, because perhaps some time ago you introduced a, a full-featured media server and this got used in all departments of your company uh, for example, marketing and catalog production and all such things, online shop, and they want to, to continue, or you, the company wants to continue using that media server, but also synchronize that media server contents to the PIM core. And for that, you wouldn't, uh, you, of course, you would be able to use the web dev interface, um, but you would need a middleware which fetches the contents from the original server and put it into the PIM core. With the data director, this is much easier, and I'll show you how that works. Let me first uh, delete those entries here. And then we set up a new data port called assets. And select as a source data type file system this time. So for a file system, this, uh, file system import, we do not have a file where we have all the information in, but we use the real files and the file system as import resource. The import class should be assets, so we want to create assets from those files on the file system. And to pass to the import files, I have to copy that from the sheet. This is this one. Enter that here. And our as a target folder, let's keep that on root, though so that's the same as we did. Previously, we want to just directly import that to the root, to the assets root. And now for file system imports, as we do not have any CSV file, for example, or other meta file where we have uh, the data, we, we have to create the data of the files ourselves. And we do that by establishing or by executing CLI commands on these files. Um, for example, we use or we we fetch the file name. We do that by executing base name and then file. File is some kind of magic variable here, as always when you want to access the file or file path and pass that to to a command, then you can use dollar uh, file here. And when save that, you see that this will output. The file name of the file which get, got found. Let me just show you what is inside that directory. You see it here. When I do an ls call on the 
on the directory which are specified, then we see that there are three images in, and those are of course those which I imported previously to PIMCore uh, and now deleted. So it's, it's the same images. Um, but in this, uh, this time we do not only want to synchronize the, uh, the files from the file system, but we also want to ensure that quality criteria are fulfilled. I described this uh, as this goal. We want to automatically import images with a minimum resolution of a thousand by a thousand pixels. So we do not want to import smaller images and uh, to, to ensure this rule we have to first extract the, the width of the image uh, in our raw data field. So we create a field width and then let me just copy the command for getting the width of, uh, the width of a file. Uh, we do it this way. Uh, identify comes from image magic and then we just um, as output we give out the weight and as the file again we use dollar file. We do the same for the height only with the h parameter and when we save that then we see that the height width and height are getting fetched from those commands. Now for file system imports it's important that we have to add another special field which is called file. Uh, this contains the path to a copy of the file because in the raw data import for file system imports um, the actual file is getting is getting copied to a temporary directory so that when you first start the raw data import then leave some time and then start the the, the data object or the asset import in, in the meantime when in the meantime the original file got removed or got edited then you wouldn't want to uh, to import that file for this reason we uh, copy the original file to a temporary directory and then do uh, the asset import and afterwards after the asset import the copied file gets deleted so there isn't any risk that in the meantime between the raw data import and the PIM import, and it, uh, the original image gets edited. Now we can go to the attribute mapping. And for this is pretty much the same as the data object import, we, but we have less fields. Um, in our case, we want to use the file name as the key field. So we just assign that as raw data it a file name and said that this is the key field. Uh, but the, the file to be used is or, or has to be input into stream field. The stream field um, is the, the, the file contents or defines the file contents and when we assign this to, to the copied file which we, which we extracted in our raw data fields and then this just will work. Uh, we could set other data here, metadata and tags and properties, but we do not want to do to, to that for in this workshop, perhaps in a later one. And now we come to the point where we want to restrict our import to only re importing pixel uh, images by a minimum resolution of a thousand by a thousand pixels. We do that in the key field, or in the file name uh, mapping in this case, um, but it's also the key field. Uh, we see here that in the raw item data, we can access the width and the height. And we only want to, or well, let, let's create a rule for that uh, when we, when the, width a small a thousand or the height is smaller than a thousand pixels 
then we return null. Otherwise, we return the assigned file name. You see here, file name is 512 pixel cycling Amsterdam. That's our file name. Uh, and that means if the resolution of the image is too small, then we return null. And the data director interprets returning null for a key field that the raw data item should be skipped. Let me show you this in the preview. Ah, no, we haven't started the raw data import. Let's start that. There are our images, and we see that the first, Im uh, the first image is too small. It doesn't fulfill our constraint of being a thousand by a thousand pixels. And when we import that, then we'll see the, the log skipping item because all key columns are empty. So when you want to skip an item, a raw data item, then you have to return null for all key fields, and then this raw item gets skipped. Now when we import the second one, then we'll see that this fulfills our limitations for the resolution, and so this gets imported. See it here at the end, successfully saved the file. When we refresh the assets tree, then we'll see that the image is there. There it is. Uh, now when we import this again, then again, uh, like in all other imports, our key field limit, uh, our key field uh, matches to an already existing asset, and for this reason, the the image gets overwritten, or in this case, as this is the same image, so the hashes get compared, uh, nothing gets done. So this is the exact behavior which we want when we want to synchronize the file system folder to our PIM core assets. There it is, and logs is essentially the same. Um, but when we refresh the assets tree, then we'll see that only one image exists. And now when we start the complete import, then we'll see that at the end only two images will get imported because one does not fulfill our limitations for the resolution. Let me refresh this. Yes, you can see it here on the side. So this way you can, for example, um, use the color space of the images, the resolution, or any other data which you want to be fulfilled. For example, when you have a folder which gets used for for catalog production or web to print application, then the color space, for example, should be CMYK, perhaps, or when you have the images to be deployed for the, to, for the website, then you would only need RGB images. And as I've shown, perhaps also there should be a minimum resolution, and this way you can um, for, or you can guarantee that all the assets which get imported to your PIM core. Um, at least when they synchronize, synchronize from a file system folder, all those assets fulfill those quality criteria. And that's, that's how you can synchronize a file system folder to your PIM core. And also if you would change then the file in the file system folder as, as soon as the file names match, and also of course subfolders are possible, I haven't shown that, but it's possible, and as soon, as soon as you change the file, the file gets overwritten in PIM core, so you always have the update, uh, the up-to-date versions of your assets in PIM core. Okay, then that's all for today. Uh, thanks for listening, and I hope you learned something new. So let's see us in the fourth workshop. If you got any further questions about mentioned features and configuration options of the PIMCOR data director, please browse through our YouTube channel. If you do not find answers to your questions there, 
please feel free to contact our technical support team to hilfe at blackbit.de. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel to remain up to date and thank you for watching.